this morning, after talking about education at 10 o'clock, uh, we're going to have a little bit of education here at, at 11 o'clock, dealing with concordances. And so uh, I hope you appreciate uh, what I'm trying to communicate in this series of lessons, uh, which is not so much how to rightly divide the Bible, which we have covered before. We have a series about how to rightly divide the Bible on the website, but more of how do you open a Bible and study it? What are the, the, the steps? What are the techniques? What tools do you use? Because it's a daunting book, this Bible. Uh, almost 800,000 words in this Bible. You know, 66 books, 31,000 uh, verses. Uh, where do I begin? What do I do? What does it look like to study the Bible? And we, we covered a couple weeks ago that Bible study was not just sitting and listening to other people who studied the Bible. That's not your Bible study. That's someone else's Bible study. Uh, you can learn from that, and that's helpful, but it's not you being invested in personal Bible study. So we're trying to communicate how do you study the Bible? What are the steps you take? How do you do it? How do you make these connections? And so we started out dealing with uh, why we should study the Bible and dealt with some tools of the trade um, that, quite frankly, aren't taught to people. And because of that, uh, the Bible is a closed book to many people, You know, where they'll hear teachers and, and preachers and pastors and and, and it seems like that they just know a lot of things about the Bible, and rightfully so, because hopefully they've studied things out, but they think it's beyond their grasp. And what we're trying to do is say, well, it is within your grasp. It takes some know-how, so it takes some knowledge, it takes some learning, it takes some work, and yet you can do it, okay? And God has uh, purposed that you do it, okay? God says in the Bible that you meditate on his words, you study his words. We saw David in Psalm 119, a few weeks ago, says, I rejoice at your words, and they're more valuable than gold and silver. And so above all things, we pursue what the Bible says, an understanding of God's word, okay? And so that's what we're trying to communicate. But for many people, the Bible's a closed book. They have it on their shelves, they carry it with them, but they don't know how to use it, okay, except for a paperweight. And maybe because they're lazy, but hopefully that's not your case this morning. Uh, the other reason why they don't use it is because they don't know how. All they, they know what to do is read a book. That's what they do with other books. And it's a long book to read, so you can't read it in one week. And so it takes a long time, and some parts of the Bible are pretty dry reads. And so how is it that I get these gems, get the jewels? How do I dig out the gold and silver from this Bible? How do I profit from Bible study? And so we're trying to figure out how to make Bible study profitable. Okay. Now, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, there's something important here to realize. And that, of course, is that you will not understand the spiritual things of God, which are contained in this book. Unless you yourself have the Spirit of God, unless you are saved. We've covered that so many times before. And that is the first step, of course. You understand the gospel that Christ died for your sins. He resurrected. He makes you part of a new creature. He does things to you that you don't yet even know about. But you need to trust that God is true, that he died for your sins, and that your duty now is to serve him. And that is your responsibility. In 1 Corinthians 2, it teaches us that we have the Spirit of God in us. You don't feel him. You don't hear him talking. If you do hear him talking to you in an audible voice, you maybe need to, to take some pills or something. I don't know. But the Bible is God's Spirit talking to us. The Bible is God speaking to us. If we want to hear God's words to us, we read the book he wrote. In 1 Corinthians 2, it says in, oh, let's back up to verse 8 or 9. Paul says, we speak the, the wisdom of God in a mystery, verse 7 says. Verse eight, uh, 9 says, As it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for them that love him. And Paul is actually quoting Isaiah 64 in that verse right there, when he says, No one can see, no one can hear the things that God prepared for them. Right? And people say, Well, God works in mysterious ways. Well, actually, the next verse, Paul says, But God hath revealed them unto us. You see? So there are things that, even in the Old Testament, things under Isaiah that they did not know that we now know when we have our completed Bible here. Paul says, God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. And so you can only understand God's spiritual truth in this book if you have the Spirit of God. You who are saved have the Spirit of God. He speaks to you through these words. So come into this book with a heart of faith, believing it as God's words helps you tremendously. Okay? When you come to this book, praying to God, thank you for your words. I believe your words. Let them be true. Let me be found in fault so I can change and conform to your words. That changes everything, folks. 
because when you come to this book thinking it's just like any other book and thinking that it may be wrong, has mistakes, has, has errors in it, you will not change. This book will be changed by you. Okay? But we want the other, the, other, the other result to happen, you to be changed in accordance with this book. So realize that the Spirit wrote this book, and the Spirit of God also dwells in you. So that in verse 12 it says, We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are, that are freely given to us of God. That's why we study the Bible. That's why we study the Holy Spirit-inspired words in this book, is because we want to know what God has prepared for us. We want to know what God has freely given to us, and we do it by studying this book. Okay, it's so important to, to do Bible study. And so we're learning this morning about some tools to make that more profitable, and hopefully that sees a, a, a result of increased growth in you. Okay, Verse 13 says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. And so when we're learning things from the Bible, we're talking about what the Bible says, we're using, we should be using the Holy Ghost words. Okay, Bible study is not you reading books about the Bible. Bible study is not you reading commentaries. Commentaries are man's comments on the Bible. Okay, It's not you reading theological books. Again, I've got theological books, you have some theological books, but that's not Bible study. That's asking a man, what do you think? Okay, When you study the Bible, what you're doing is consulting what the Holy Ghost teaches. This book is the Holy Ghost's words, God's word. And so you're saying, what does the Holy Ghost teach? And you study these words, not the words of man's wisdom, but the words of the Holy Ghost, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So you are saved, you are a spiritual man now, you're spiritually alive, and this book was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So you're comparing, when you come to this book in faith, you, in your spirit, alive in Jesus Christ, with this book, God's Spirit's words, speaking to you. Okay. So this is, this is, again, why it's important to study God's word and to be concerned with the words that are contained in this book. The words matter. They're God's words. They're the Holy Ghost's words to you. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, remember that guy who asked the Lord when the Lord was ministering to Israel, and he said, uh, you know, help my unbelief. Remember that? He said, help my unbelief. You know, give us faith. The disciples asked Jesus to increase our faith. Right? And of course, they didn't have 1 Corinthians. They didn't have Romans. They didn't have the, the entire New Testament inspired yet. But they were asking, please increase our faith. But you know where faith comes from, Paul says in Romans 10? Hearing the word of God. Your faith will be strengthened when you know the words the Holy Ghost inspired in this book and you understand them. Your faith, which is in things you don't see, faith is things you don't see, will become stronger because you understand God's words and God's words have authority. Okay? So Bible study is not reading commentaries. It's not reading spiritual books or theological books or, or man's comments or listening to, to, to preachers. That's not Bible study. That's preaching and you listening. Bible study is you opening this book, reading the actual words, which you can understand. And when you understand them, your faith is increased and you grow in God's word. Okay? So when we're talking about Bible study, this morning specifically, we're talking about word study, aren't we? Man, we're going to get academic now. Word study. And English was your least favorite class. But you speak English, and we've got a Bible that God has inspired and preserved in English, and the words matter. Without understanding these words, without studying these words, we'll never come to understand it. Okay, so Bible study is word study. As a result, because of that, in history, um, the, the literacy that's been, uh, the literacy that has increased in Western civilization across the world has been a result mainly from people trying to read uh, the Bible. Okay, they printed the Bible and taught people how to read from the Bible. It creates literacy among you. Uh, it increases your vocabulary. You read this book, and you won't know every word in the English language. Okay, there's not that many. There's only about 8,000 words in this Bible, different words. There are hundreds of thousands in the English language. And yet when you read this book, there's something about it that makes you more literate. It makes you, increases your vocabulary, your understanding, because you start understanding true things. You know, some words just aren't, aren't worth saying, right? And, and you, you learn what words are and aren't from, from studying God's words. But it, it builds a vocabulary. A lot of the dictionaries in the English language came after your King James Bible was created. So this Bible was, was translated and put into English, and the dictionaries of your language were created from it. Okay? And so we'll see here in a bit that we can use the words in your Bible to build your own definition. And they won't be yours. They'll be God's, because these are God's words inspired. Okay? So we're talking about word study. We're talking about studying the Bible... Uh, and studying the vocabulary, studying the definitions, studying the sentences and the paragraphs, and that sort of thing. That's his Bible study. And so when we're doing this, and looking at the words in our Bible, there are few, few tools that are more helpful for you 
than a concordance, an exhaustive concordance. Now, and this is what we're talking about this morning, connecting the Bible and getting understanding from your Bible using concordances. Now, this is not the Bible, and yet it has words in the Bible in it. Okay? This is a tool, and we're going to learn about what a concordance is and why it's so helpful for Bible study today. Okay? We need to study the Bible. A concordance is nothing more than a reference tool. Okay, it's an alphabetical index of every Bible word in your Bible. Every word in your Bible is indexed in that book. Even the words like a, and, and the. Those are lengthy parts of this book. Uh, fortunately, the publishers have put those in the back of your book so they don't clog, clog the middle. But it lists every word in your Bible. Say, so how is that helpful? Well, we'll see here in a bit. There's a lot of different ways you can use that to try to make connections in your Bible. Understanding happens when you have two parts of the Bible that you're able to see a connection with. They're able to tie a thread among. I remember back when I was in the first studying the Bible, uh, back in college with a group, and uh, uh, we were talking about what the Bible meant in this passage or that passage. And I had no clue how to figure it out. I read the verse, that was it. I read it again, okay, I read it. I, I know what the verse says, but how do I explain this? And suddenly there's people in my, in my groups, and you know, they had the privilege of being pastor's kids when they were raised. You know, so they knew something about Bible study. And they talked about seeing threads in the Bible. And they quoted a verse from another book. I said, where did you pull that verse from? They just pulled it out of thin air, it seemed like. And that verse had something to do exactly with the verse we were reading. That's amazing. How did you do that? How did you pull that cross-reference out? How did you know to make that connection? But making those connections are so important in Bible study, in your understanding. Okay? Uh, reading the, the verses is important. Reading the Bible is extremely important. But the next step in studying the Bible is trying to make connections with what God teaches about what doctrine. Doing that by connecting verses in your Bible. A concordance can help us with that because it lists every instance of every word in your Bible. Okay, The first English concordances, like the first English dictionaries, were not written until the 16th century. Okay. The Strong's, which is the, the version of the concordance I have here in the front, was not published until 1890. That's just a little over 100 years ago. Okay. So it hasn't been very long in the history of the English language that we've had a tool like this to increase Bible study. And people ask the question, like, well, how come I've never heard of Minak Pauline Wright Division in history? How come I never heard people in the past that teach what you're preaching? Well, it's not because I'm so smart. Okay. But there are connections in the Bible that they probably didn't see. And it may be because they didn't have the tools to see them. There are things that technology now, that scientists now can discover, things that you can learn uh, about the world that we could not see before. We didn't have the advancement to see them. Okay? And it's the same thing in the Bible. People read the Bible. They've had the Bible for thousands of years, and they study it. But you know how hard it is to memorize 30, uh, you know, what, 1,600 verses, 31,000 31, verses, 1,600 chapters? How to memorize every part of the Bible? Very hard. Sometimes people, that's the only book they had, and so they had plenty of time to, to read it and study it. But how often have you thought, where's that verse in the Bible? I heard a verse once about this in the Bible. I just don't know where it's at. How long has it taken you to find that verse? Sometimes you forget about it because it takes so much work to find it. I've got to read the whole Bible to find that verse again. That's not worth it. You know, so how, how many times has it been where, where do I find that, that such and so? It says somewhere in the Bible, doesn't it? Sometimes I get emails like this. People ask me questions. Does it say in the Bible somewhere? Or do you know where in the Bible it says this? And what does that communicate to me? Not that they're dumb. That, I don't think, well, that's a stupid question. I don't think that at all. It communicates to me that you know, they don't know how to use the tools at their disposal. Okay? If someone comes to you and they're planting a garden or building a, a, you know, a building or something, they're like, well, how do I get that dirt out of the ground and move it over there? You dig it. Right? Look at their hands. You know, how? A shovel, right? But very common, you use a shovel. You in the ground, it's, help, it's a helpful tool. So when someone says, where do I find this verse in the Bible? Don't you know how to find verses in the Bible? But I'm finding that a lot of people don't. And that's okay, but this is why we're teaching this lesson, is to figure out how do you find verses in the Bible? How do you study them? How do you make connections? How do you study the Bible? Because we've forgotten that knowledge. That we've lost that knowledge. And quite frankly, in history, some of the tools we have are very recent, like the concordance. Okay, so... Uh, Strong's was until 1890 uh, is when it was first published, and it's been so helpful ever since. Now, on this concordance I have up here, you'll see if you, if you purchase the Strong's, you should buy the Strong's exhaustive concordance. It says exhaustive concordance of the Bible. That word exhaustive means it's complete. It has exhausted 
the words. There are concordances that you can buy. There are concordances probably in the back of your Bible uh, that are not exhaustive. They do not contain every word or do not contain every reference. Are they helpful? Yeah, they're helpful, but they're not exhaustive. Okay, an exhaustive co uh, concordance lists every word, every reference, so it's a, it's a humendous benefit to you. A tremendous benefit to you because you know exactly where every instance of that word is in your Bible. Okay, so exhaustive means it has every word, every name, every place. But beware, not every concordance is exhaustive. So you need to be aware of that when you're looking for a concordance and trying to get one. Of course, if you have a computer software or Bible software, that's nowadays replacing concordances in print, as it is other books as well, because you can very quickly just search the Bible for a word and you have the same same result. Okay. And so as we're talking about concordances, this is not limited to just the print concordance. It's, it's something you can also use these techniques with uh, electronic concordances or Bible software. Okay. Now something else you need to remember is that concordances are translation specific. This is another reason why translations of your Bible matter. Okay, words matter. If words matter, translations matter. Do not believe what you hear when they say, oh, words don't matter in your Bible. They do. Didn't we just read a verse talking about the words of the Holy Ghost? Well, what words are those? I want the words of the Holy Ghost. I don't want some paraphrase of the Holy Ghost. I don't want some man's interpretation of what the Greek says. I want the words of the Holy Ghost preserved for me. Okay, so you need to have the understanding that translations matter, and concordances especially. It says James Strong and the, the men that helped him put together the Strong Concordance exhaustively, they did that from the King James Bible. Okay, you cannot get a strong, exhaustive concordance in any other translation. Now, there are concordances for the translations, but don't believe the marketing hype when they say, well, here's a Strong's for the NIV. James Strong was long dead before the NIV was published. Okay, and the NIV changes its words every 12 years anyway. So even if you had an NIV concordance from the 1970s, it's different now. You see, you see how translations matter? We should have the same words, folks, so that we can study the same book and the same words. As soon as you start changing the words in your Bible, you can't study it anymore. It's now, the concordance I used to have is now out of date. And how long does it take to create a new one? You see, words matter. And so every word in your Bible matters. Matthew 4, 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds of the mouth of God. We studied two weeks ago how we learned using the concordance that what Jesus was saying when he said that in Matthew 4 was a quote of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Only using concordance. We didn't have to read the whole Bible to figure that out. A concordance tells us, hey, look, we can look up the mouth of God or look up that proceedeth or bread there. We saw in Deuteronomy 8, he's quoting the same verse. So we create a connection, a cross-reference by using a concordance. Okay? It saves a lot of time from rereading the whole Bible looking for that reference. Okay, that's an important use of the Bible. Look at John 3.16. John 3.16. Translations matter. The words in your Bible matter, specifically when we're trying to study the words of our Bible. Now, translations may not matter to you if you don't study the Bible. You just listen to the preacher, and the preacher often says, the Greek here for that and the Hebrew there for this is thus and so. But when you start studying the Bible, it suddenly matters what words you have to study. John 3.16 is one of the places that translators debate and that translations differ on how it is translated. By the way, there was no difference in translation for hundreds of years. It's only been in the last century that people have changed the words of your Bible to meet translations based on the idea that God has not preserved his words. No, that's, that's a lie. Remember, I used to have the idea when I was young that it doesn't matter what translation you use because all of them are translated by godly men who don't want to you know, give you errors and mistakes. Well, that may be so. They may be godly. But some of them, a lot of them nowadays, do not believe that God has preserved his words. They think some of them are lost. They think that God preserves the idea, but the words don't matter that much. I can't agree. I believe God inspired his words perfectly and has preserved them for us to use. The actual words. Okay. Obviously, Jesus didn't speak English, but we can translate those words into English, can't we? And the words matter. John 3, 16, of course, you all know the verse. In King James, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? So we're not going to study the doctrine at the moment uh, for this verse, except uh, that word begotten, we need to realize, does not, is not in the NIV, the NASV. Okay? It's not in the other translations. You say, what's the point of that? So what? Can't we get the same idea if the word's not there? Well, actually, it's important that it says it's the only begotten Son. 
Because as the NIV says, Jesus was God's only son, is not true. You are a son of God, Romans chapter 8, by faith in the gospel. Okay? Israel was called God's firstborn son in Exodus 4.22. So the fact that Jesus was God's only son isn't accurate. He's his only begotten son. You weren't born of God in the sense Jesus was. You weren't begotten of God in that sense. You're in Christ, you get resurrection. But you're adopted, right? There's a difference there. But there's something even further. When we're studying the Bible using a concordance, and we use this as an example, we look up that word begotten in our concordance. And we see something interesting. In fact, turn to the back of your Bibles. I don't know if you have concordances in the back of your Bible. But you may have, and this is a common word, so even if you don't have an exhaustive concordance, it probably has the word begotten. I'll turn to the back of my Bible. This is why concordances are in your Bible, by the way. You ever wondered that? What is this dictionary that's not a dictionary in the back of my Bible? <laughs> it's concordance. It's uh, not exhaustive, but it gives you some popular words that uh, helps you find cross-references. So if you remember a word in a verse, you can go back to concordance in your Bible and see if you can find the reference to it. Um, let's look up the word begotten. In my concordance in the back of this Bible here, it's not exhaustive, of course, but I look up the word begotten, and I find some references here that also have the word begotten in them. Now, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, what does everybody think that verse means? That Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary, that God gave his only begotten son. Some people will say, oh, well, he gave his son to die on the cross, which is true, but of course, Jesus isn't saying that. He never said he gave his son to die. He's talking about him coming down from heaven, right? But we can find some information by looking at our concordance. If you look at the word begot in your concordance, I have Psalm 2, verse 7 next to mine. Do you have Psalm 2, verse 7 in your concordance? It's a very popular cross-reference. In Psalm 2, verse 7, uh, God says back there, This day have I begotten thee. This day. There's another verse with the word begotten in it. Does your concordance have Acts 13, 33? It doesn't. Some do, some don't. It's a little harder. That's why you need an exhaustive concordance. It has every verse with the word in it. But some do, some don't. Acts 13, 33, we can turn there. We see another verse with the word begotten in it. Now, again, we haven't, we haven't called upon our own genius yet, and we're not calling upon our own mental capacity to comprehend. All we're doing is finding verses that have the same word in it. They may be totally unrelated. We don't know. But Psalm 2, 7 says, This day have I begotten thee, talking about the Messiah. In John 3, 16, Jesus says, God gave his only begotten Son. Acts 13, 33, Paul says, that uh, in verse 32, we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You see what we've done? With only the use of a concordance, we've made a pretty good cross-reference and learned something about begotten. Because in John 3, when Jesus said God gave his only begotten son, we found that word begotten in Psalm 2, that this day God begot the Messiah. In Acts 13, 33, Paul says that's fulfilled when he resurrected. You see that? He hath has, he has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he raised up Jesus again, as Psalm 2, 7 says. So apparently, just by looking at those three verses, we can see that Jesus was begotten at his resurrection. You know why you get resurrected? It's because you're in Christ. Why did Christ get resurrected? Because he was God's begotten son, you say. It's proof that he's God. It's proof that he's the son of God. And we learned that from a concordance. Isn't that amazing? The concordance didn't teach us that. We just, it just showed us the verses. And now we're connecting verses. We're making a connection. We can see a fulfillment of prophecy in Psalm 2 in Acts 13 with John 3. And so now we know that John 3 is not talking about a manger. John 3 is not talking about the cross. It doesn't mention the cross. It's talking about his resurrection. Jesus said, I'm from heaven and you can't kill God if I die, I'm going to raise up again. And Paul said, that's what happened. He rose up, just like Psalm 2 said. And he was begotten. Okay. Interesting there. The words matter. You know, you lose that study that we just did. You lose that. If you take out the word begotten. Totally gone. If it says God's only son, you're not looking up the word begotten. Why would you? You wouldn't know the cross-reference. See, see what? The words matter. Every word in your Bible matters. Because you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <clears throat> so a lot of people in our culture today will say the words don't, but don't believe them. Uh, they do when it comes to God's word. Okay. Now, we've already started as an example of how to use concordance, but I want to go through very specifically here uh, different ways to use your concordance. 
We've seen just one real quick there. You look up a word, you see the references in your concordance, you study those verses, see if you can learn something from them, right? You'll get, a, you get very far doing that. In fact, you will not exhaust the riches you can find by comparing verses in your Bible for the rest of your life. You won't. It's impossible. Too many words to look up. Lots of things to study, a lot of verses to compare. A concordance makes it easier for you to make those connections. Here's a, here's a pro tip. Using a concordance. <clears throat> if you're going to look up a word in your concordance, make sure it's an uncommon word. You can look up any word you want. Every word's in there. But if you're looking up the word son, for example, his only begotten son, you know how many verses have the word son in it? A lot. You need to spend a lot of time looking for those verses. But that word begotten, fewer verses have that word in it. 25. 25. Jim counted and so you, you have more uncommon words in your Bible that will help you find connections, okay? So if you can, remember an uncommon word. When you're thinking, where is that verse in the Bible? You know, I know a verse that talked about this, you know, a verse that said something like this. Oftentimes you remember a phrase in a verse, not the whole verse of reference. If you can remember a unique word or an uncommon word or a bigger word in your memory, that'll help you in a concordance. I remember it said the. You know what, that's not going to help you. <laughs> you know, I remember it says something about purloining. Yeah, that'll help. There's only a few verses in the Bible have that in there. Right. And so you can use concordance to find the verse. So uh, number one way to use concordance is just to find verses. Doesn't it say in the Bible somewhere, God's not the author of confusion? You ever heard that? God's not the author of confusion. People quote this all the time. It's just a saying in Christian language. you know. Or even what we say as a slogan a lot of times. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. Where's that in the Bible? Like, we say it all the time. Where's that? You know, Let God be true and every man a liar. Where's that in the Bible? Well, we can look that up in the scripture. So if you use your concordance in the back of your Bible again. This is a very common reference. If you look up the word confusion in your concordance on the back of your Bible, all you with smartphones are cheating. No, you're not. <laughs> Just get there quicker. Um, look up the word confusion in your concordance, and I've got it here in the Strong's, and it's got just about, I don't know, 20 different references there. So, And I'm skimming down through here, and I'll eventually get to 1 Corinthians 14.33, where it says the concordance, the, it shows me the word before and after that word confusion. And it says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of. And it tells me right there what the reference is. So now I know. So now I can go to 1 Corinthians 14, where that reference is at, because I remember what people say. God's not the author of confusion. And I go there and I read that Paul's talking about speaking in tongues in that whole chapter. And he's saying, God's not the author of confusion. Man, if people understood why Paul said God's not the author of confusion, I think we'd have less confusion in the church. <laughs> There's a lot of people speaking and things that people don't know what they're saying, and they're just causing confusion. But meanwhile, <clears throat> uh, that word confusion, by the way, is not in other translations either. So <laughs> words matter, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 14. <clears throat> but we can find verses in our Bible based on what we remember from reading it before or hearing it from someone else. Sometimes pastors or teachers will let you hear, will just quote part of the verse and not the whole reference. Right? You can write down the words that he quotes and try to look it up in your concordance later. Okay, So it's a, a very useful purpose for your concordance. Another way to use your concordance is to find the meaning of a word. You say, Justin, if I want the meaning of a word, I'll just look it up in the dictionary. Right? The concordance is not a dictionary. But you know what? Sometimes the dictionaries aren't right. How can you say that they're dictionaries? You're undermining all of civilization. Well, well, no, dictionaries, as I pointed out, were actually created after your Bible was translated. And a lot of times, the dictionaries of your language, language are created from compiling all the words that people speak. And so if you want to know what God means by a word, you take all the words that God ever said, put them together, and try to find all the places he used the word, and you'll find a pretty good definition in God's mind. You can know God's dictionary. And we have a pretty big book. There's lots of times Paul use, or God uses words. And so if we had a tool that would list every place a word shows up, we can define the word. Hey, a concordance. It gives you everywhere the word is in your Bible, and you can find a definition. For example, look at 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 27. 2 Samuel 15, 27. Reading through your daily Bible reading, and you get to this part, and You've heard that there were archaic words in your Bible. You just never ran upon one until now. And you read 2 Samuel chapter 15. <clears throat> and you see that the king said also unto Zadok, <clears throat> the priest, Art not thou a seer? 
Return to the city of peace and your two sons with you. A seer? Art not thou a seer? And you don't know how to answer the guy. Um, I can see. Is he asking, am I blind? What does that word seer mean? Well, we can turn to the dictionary, but modern dictionaries may not even have that word in it. It may not have the biblical definition of that word. Okay, We won't use that word in, on street language nowadays. Hey, are you a seer? You know, they don't use the word. So we can use it in accordance. How does God use that word? And so we look up the word seer. i got handy little post-it notes on mine. But you can look up in the back of your Bible, the word seer, and you'll see all the listings for that word. And hey, lo and behold, I see the very second reference in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 9. It says, a prophet was before time called a seer. Hey, that's helpful. And that's a Bible verse. You want a definition with authority? Get it from the Bible. Right? Isaiah 9, verse 9, we now know a seer in God's language is a prophet. Okay? Well, that makes more sense. Art not thou a prophet? Art not thou a seer? We can find definitions by using a concordance, by collecting all the places where a word appears and reading the context and trying to figure out what it means. If I use the word just once, it's hard to know what it means. If I use the word 50 times or 100 times, you start to develop an understanding of what it means. Okay, a concordance can help you with that, defining words in your Bible that you don't understand. Look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 11. Here's another fun little example. <clears throat> you're reading Revelation chapter 8 because you're trying to find the signs of the times, right? You're trying to prove that Bill Gates is the Antichrist. You just can't find that verse. We're not going to find it. But in Revelation 8, verse 11, <clears throat> we come upon this verse here. When the third angel sounded, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. That's pretty easy to understand. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. We're doing good so far. And the name of the star was called Wormwood. What? What's Wormwood? And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died because of the Wormwood. And it says because they were made bitter. So what's this Wormwood all about? You know, I didn't live back in the first century. I don't use this word very much. What does it mean? Well, let's look it up in a concordance. Modern dictionaries may not have that word. It's, like it's a word in your... King James Bible, but in a concordance <clears throat> it has the word. And so we look it up, and we find uh, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 4. <clears throat> in our concordance. Now, I've, I've already pre-looked these things up, by the way, folks. That's why I get to verses so quickly. But you, you have so many verses in your concordance, you can find these in a reference. You just skim down, take a few seconds. And Proverbs 5, verse 4 says, um, The lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Apparently, wormwood is bitter. Well, so we saw that in Revelation 8.11 as well. It said men died because the water was bitter. Well, now we know that it was bitter because of the wormwood. Wormwood made it bitter. Okay? We see in Jeremiah 9.15, another place listed in our concordance. It has the word wormwood in it. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 15, God here says that, uh, <clears throat> Behold, I will feed them, Israel, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. So we see here a punishment that God promised on these people that he would make their food and their water bitter. Apparently, and wormwood was used in that. Isn't that interesting? Because we started our, our search in Revelation chapter 8, where God pours out wormwood on the water. You know, the wormwood comes down as a star from heaven. And we go back to Jeremiah 9, and we suddenly found a prophecy back here. A prophecy that predicted that God would poison the waters with wormwood. Now we've made a connection. Suddenly, Revelation 8 isn't so random. Suddenly, wormwood's talked about more in the Bible. And we see how prophecy in Jeremiah 9 can be fulfilled in Revelation 8. Well, you must be a biblical scholar. Well, no, the concordance showed me every verse in the Bible with the word wormwood in it. That was pretty simple to study out. Okay? A use for your concordance, finding definitions of, of what words mean. And coincidentally, you can find out what God's trying to say. <clears throat> Some words have many definitions, like the word tongue. The Bible's helpful in this regard as well. You look up the word tongue, you say, well, I want to know, what is this speaking in tongues business? So you, you don't know where to start your Bible study on tongues. You see good or concordance, and you look up the word tongue in your concordance. You get a ton of verses with the word tongue in it. But you got some extra work you got to do because there's going to be more than one definition of the word tongue. The first thing you find in the list in your concordance is Genesis chapter 10, verse 5, where it says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles 
divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Apparently, the word tongue there is talking about languages. It's talking about people's separate qualities, their languages. Okay, You can see later in the book of Genesis that, that use of the word tongue shows up again and again. You know, the, the English tongue, you know, the, the Chinese tongue, or whatever it is. <coughs> but we see another definition in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. As we're scrolling through our concordance, <coughs> reading every verse with the word tongue in it. <coughs> and we see in Exodus 4, verse 10, Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. I am of a slow of speech. I am of a slow tongue. You see that? So he's talking about saying, I'm of slow Hebrew language. He's talking about the way he speaks, the words that come out of his mouth. So apparently the tongue can mean the words that come out of your mouth. We've seen it mean a language, a people's language, the words that come out of your mouth. And we can find a third definition in Mark 7, 33, which is the most common sense. But in Mark 7, 33, <coughs> Jesus uh, comes upon a man who cannot speak, and he's deaf. And he took him aside from the multitude, and he put his fingers into his ears, and he spit, and he touched his tongue. Kids, don't try this at home. Right? <laughs> and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, uh, Apapta, and that is be opened. And so the Bible tells you what the, the, the foreign language means there. And his ears were open, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. Apparently here, the word tongue actually means his tongue. <laughs> his actual tongue. He touched his tongue. He didn't touch the language of this man or the words that he spoke. It means his actual, you know, the body part tongue. And so you find these three definitions of the Bible, the word tongue. Either human language of some sort, the words that a person is speaking, the tongue, the words of their mouth, or the actual tongue in their body. Okay? And this helps because as we're asking the question, what is the doctrine of tongues? What do people talk about when they talk about tongues? Well, look at 1 Corinthians 12, and you'll find this in your concordance as well because it listed all the verses in your Bible that have the word tongue in it. And this verse is a part of them. And so down in 1 Corinthians 12, oh, thank you, verse 10. To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Well, we've got three definitions of the word tongue in your Bible. We've got languages, we've got the words that a person speaks, and the actual body part. Which one of those would fit in this verse? Languages. languages. Go back to Acts 2, another place in your Bible that speaks about tongues, and it talks about languages that they didn't know, but other people knew. Human languages. Okay. So suddenly we don't have to speculate about something that the Bible doesn't talk about we can see what the Bible says and get understanding about tongues from using a concordance. That's all we did is look up the verses that had the word tongue in it and, and listed the definitions and tried to apply it to a passage that people find difficulty with. Right? So now we're studying the Bible using a concordance. It's very helpful, this tool. So you can define words and what they mean, and you can get understanding that way. A third way to use a concordance is to create topical studies. Now we're getting advanced. I didn't go to seminary. I'm not a pastor. I can't create outlines. Well, you can. Okay, easy. Get a concordance. Find every instance of the word in your Bible and find the ones that have the same context and meaning. Put them in three points in an outline. Find a joke book. Put a joke in there. Suddenly, you got a lesson. All right? If we use a concordance to find every place in the Bible that has the word cross in it, we rightly divide the word of truth. We understand that Paul is our pattern. And so we find the word for cross, or the, the verses for cross, and we want to see what Paul teaches about the cross. And so we, we, we look at our concordance and find the verses that Paul uses the word cross. And we find very easily in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made an effect. Apparently the cross of Christ is more significant than baptism. Right? Apparently this is something that Paul is trying to amplify. The next verse says, For the preaching of the cross is then that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Okay? Do another concordance search. Romans 1.16 says, The power of God and the salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the preaching of this cross, apparently. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18. Look at Galatians 6.14. Now, I'm telling you to turn to Galatians 6.14, and I got this verse from my concordance, just looking up every verse in the Bible that has the word cross in it. And in Galatians chapter 6, by the way, there's, there's 
only a handful of verses that Paul uses with the word cross in it. In Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Circumcision avails, uh, neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Apparently, Paul is really amplifying this cross business. So we get, we're working on an outline here. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Colossians 2, 14. It only takes a few minutes to do a study like this, folks. Colossians 2, 14. Paul says that, uh, we'll start in verse 13 here, that you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So it's talking about there the ordinances, the law that was against us, and it says the cross took God away, apparently. So we've got just three verses here. We've got the preaching of the cross, which is the power of God to salvation. We've got the glory in the cross, which were crucified in the world. And we've got here the cross, which takes the, the, the pain of the law, takes the, uh, the law that was against us, contrary to us, out of the way. That's three points. I think I'll preach, preach a lesson on that. It's called the preaching of the cross. And all I did was look that verse in the concordance. Okay? And you pay a pastor $80,000 to do that. Right? Well, you don't. People do. Anyway, <laughs> look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. That was a jab. I'm trying to make it easy for, for you guys, understanding how to study your Bible and how to make these connections. How do people know? You know, this, that was a great lesson on the preaching of the cross. Well, use concordance, find the verses. You can do your own study. You can learn this material. Okay. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Sometimes doing just a topical study, looking up a single word is... is you know, that's elementary stuff. That's kindergarten level. Let's move on to first grade. Okay, looking up larger themes. Sometimes Paul talks about the cross but doesn't use the word cross. He'll use another word. Well, okay, what happened on, at the cross there? Colossians 1 verse 20, for example, says that uh, Christ, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. So we see the word cross there, and we see that by the cross... He reconciled all things to himself. But we see this other word there, the blood of his cross. Oh, that's interesting. So apparently it's not just the cross, it's the blood that's significant. A lot of Christians wear cross symbols and things, but Paul's talking here about the blood of Christ's cross. So it's not just the cross as a religious icon, it's Christ's shed blood. And so we look up in our concordance all the instances of the word blood. And we could do another study on this and compare them with the verses that say cross. And we can see what... Christ teaches, or God teaches, about the blood of the cross. Okay, So these types of studies, when you're trying to study a theme, it may take more than one word search to look up in your course. It may take more than one uh, verse to develop a doctrine. But that's how you find answers. That's how theologians do it. <coughs> you read your commentaries, and, and you know it seems like they just knew the answer. How did they know to go all these different places? Well, it's not that difficult, folks. They looked it up in concordance, and they read the verses. They put them together, and they gave their opinion. You can do that. You can read the Bible, find a concordance, find the verses, compare them, and think about them. Right? It's called Bible study. Put them together. It's not that difficult. And so there, there's that other way, that fourth way to use concordance, to study larger themes of the Bible. You have to collect, and certain, collect related words when you do that. You saw I did that in Colossians 1.20. I saw the word cross and blood, and they're talking about the same thing there. It's the related words. Okay? Now, there's another way here to use concordance that I need to address because a lot of people thinking that uh, Bible study is uh, learning different languages will say we can use strong concordance to study the Greek. You ever heard of strong, Strong's Numbers? Yeah. What James Strong did, did is he listed every word in the Bible and every reference for every word and next to them put his own number. He just put a number there. And that number related to a Greek word from which Strong said it was translated from. So people will use that Greek number, that Strong's number, to look up the Greek word to try to find meaning for the verse. Can we use concordances to study the Greek? Well, not exactly, folks. Be careful here, very careful. In fact, I would not even encourage this. You say, well, that's, that's, that's horrible. Why wouldn't you encourage Christians to study the Greek? Because you've got a Bible in English, that's why. And you will not exhaust the riches of your Bible in English before a Greek word will profit you. Why does my pastor mention the Greek all the time? Because he does not believe your Bible in English. That's why. Because he wants to sound puffed up. He wants to sound like he knows something more than you. 
He wants to take the word and twist it to his outline, whatever the meaning, whatever the reason. Don't use a concordance to study the Greek. Okay. If you're studying Greek and Hebrew, then you can use Strong's to do that, but Strong's concordance was not created to study the Greek anyway. It just tells you a Greek word. By the way, which Greek text was it? What do you mean? The question means nothing to me. Exactly. That's why you should be looking it up. There's more than one Greek text. There's more than one Greek text from which translations are translated from, and you don't know which one Strong used. And you wouldn't have an opinion one way or another. So what's the point? You see? I'm not saying Greek words and studying Greek language is of the devil. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying beware, and that if you're trying to study the Bible, use concordance for its purpose, which was to look up the words in your Bible. Okay? There's nothing you can learn from a Greek study that you cannot learn in your English language from studying your Bible, comparing verse with verse. And that's heresy by some seminary teachers. Okay? Some very bad teachings have been taught by pastors with concordance thinking they can teach Greek by looking up words in concordance and teaching wrong things from it. Okay? So, you know English, you speak English, read your English Bible, trust it as God's words, make comparisons with concordance, beware of the Greek. Okay? Careless Greek studies lead to bad teaching. And a good example is John 21. Look at John 21. We'll give you one example here of the danger here. And again, this is why people in the past translated the Bible into English. That's why we translate the Bible into other languages so they can study it in their language. It should not be a requirement for someone to study the Bible to learn five different languages. Who can study it then? Answer? Only the people we pay to go to seminary. Right? That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you the tools to study the Bible on your own, in your own language. John 21, people will teach and they'll try to be educated in the area diet by saying, well, John 21 is an example of where the Greek is superior to the English, and you miss something in your language that you would not know unless you consulted the underlying Greek language. By the way, in case you don't know, nobody in the world has a copy of the original Greek text. Nobody. The original things that Paul wrote are lost. All we have are copies. Okay? We have lots of copies, and they're trustworthy, and yet, no one has the originals. So when people talk about the originals, no one has the originals. They have copies that are authentic. Okay? Everyone in the seminary knows that, but not everyone in the pew knows that. And so sometimes they use that word originals to try to impress you. But in John 21, verse 15, when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter says unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, I feed my sheep. Verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, feed my sheep. You know the story, we've covered this in our verse by verse through the book of John, and we studied how, remember how Peter denied Jesus three times, Right? And so Jesus, after his resurrection, and of course Peter's following his resurrection, he asks Peter three times, do you love me? Obviously a connection to the three times Peter denied him, right? But what, would, what will pastors do, and what has some uh, people who tried to study the Greek present to you? That your English Bible is insufficient, it's inferior, you cannot understand what Jesus really meant, because there's two different Greek words here used for love. And I bet you didn't know that there's one word used for love in verse 15 and 16, but verse 17, when Jesus asked the question, do you love me? It's a different Greek word. You ever heard of the word agape? You ever heard Christians say, do you love them with agape love? Yeah. You don't even speak Greek, but you use that word. Why? Because you've heard it so many times from pastors and books. They say the same thing, agape love versus what? Phileo love, right? Two different Greek words. Both mean love, but different nuance. You can't say love both times. You've got to explain what the word means, right? So the Greek is, is superior. So you can look up in your Strong's the word love, and you'll see in the Strong's there's different numbers there for the word love. One number relates to agape, Another number relates to phileo. Okay? There's a problem, though, folks. The problem that they don't tell you is that both words can mean the same thing. Okay? If I say, you're very intelligent, and then I turn around and say, you're very smart, am I saying two different things? Maybe. Or do they mean the same thing? Maybe. He's a Greek. <laughs> I mean the same thing. Smart means intelligent. What is a dictionary? When you look up a word in a dictionary, what do you get? Other words. Other words define the word you're looking up. They mean the same thing. Okay? What does up mean? 
the opposite of down. I, have to use, I can't use the word I'm looking to define in my definition. What does love mean? Love. I can't do that. I'm trying to look at the meaning for the word love. Right? What does intelligent mean? It means smart. Right? Now, there's other definitions, but that's what it means. You look at the dictionary, it's what it says. Okay? And so it is perfectly acceptable to have two words that mean the exact same thing. In fact, it happens a lot. Otherwise, we could not get any meaning out of any language. Furthermore, if we look at our concordance, studying our English Bible here, not looking at the Greek. You know what? I'm going to look at the word phileo in the Greek here. Do a little Greek study. You've never seen me do this before. Looking up the Greek word, Strong's number. What is this? Uh, phileo. G5368 is the Strong's number. In the Greek, that word love means phileo. To be a friend to, fond of, have an affection for, denoting personal attachment as a matter of sentiment or feeling. In the Greek, the word love means here, phileo, be a friend of. While G25, agape, is a wider, embracing, especially the judgment, the deliberate assent of the will as a matter of principle, the priority of love. So you have phileo, a friendly type of love, and agape, all-encompassing type of love. Right? Obviously, Jesus is saying two different things here. He's saying, Peter, do you agape love me? And the third time says, do you love me as a friend? Is that what Jesus is really saying? Well, of course he's not. But just to show you that it's kind of ridiculous that people say that these two words mean totally different things in your Bible, look at John 3.35. Look at John 3.35. I'm going to show you a couple instances here where two different Greek words for love are used, and yet I think they're saying the same thing. And I can know that from English. You don't have to know the Greek, folks. John 3.35. It's not that you shouldn't study the Greek, it's that you don't have to know it to understand your Bible in English. John 3.35, it says, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. Okay, the Father loves the Son. Look at John 5.20. John 5.20. For the Father loveth the Son, and shows him all things that himself doeth. Okay. Two verses, same exact phrase. One is agape, one is phileo. Now, are we to take in these two verses that God loves the Son differently in one verse than the other verse? Or is he just trying to say God loves the Son? He's trying to say God loves the Son. Okay. Let's look at another one. Look at John chapter 20, verse 2. So maybe he does love him differently in both verses. Well, let's show you another one. John 20, verse 2. Then she runneth, Mary Magdalene, and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. You ever heard about the disciple whom Jesus loved? Yeah. You know, it's John, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved here. Look at John 21, verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Same guy, right? Same love that Jesus, you know, Jesus loved? Well, actually, the Greek says one's a copy, one's a layer. Should be different. He must have loved him differently. No, that's nonsense. It's the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's, it's naming the person who Jesus loved. It used agape and phileo. Okay? My wife's a smart person. My wife's an intelligent person. Am I saying different things? No, I'm saying the same thing. Look at Ephesians 5.28. And it's true. Ephesians 5.28. Well, you're right on it today. <laughs> Ephesians 5.28. Instructions to all husbands out there. So ought men to agape their wives. All encompassing. Agape your wives. Right? That'll preach. Right? Agape means all encompassing. It's a matter of the will. It's love. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 4. How do the wives respond? Well, agape is too big of a word. <laughs> Titus 2, verse 4. The aged women, <clears throat> a few of those, the aged women are to teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Phileo love. So apparently, husbands agape their wives and wives phileo their husbands. You know, they, friends, brotherly kind of love, you know, Philadelphia, right? Not exactly, folks. They both mean love. And we all know in English what love means means love. Right, and, and so these verses mean the same thing. What I'm trying to prove to you from this silly example by cross-referencing these verses is that 
There are Greek numbers in your concordance. There are nuances and technical details you can find from the Greek, but they will not profit you as much as you studying the Bible in English, comparing verse with verse to find out what God is saying to you. Okay? That's why he's preserved and inspired your Bible for you. Now, of course, if you have Bible software, a lot of these uses can be amplified. And so, you know, because I'm biased and I use a computer myself, I would encourage you to learn how to use a computer. But I know there are people who do not, and this is fine. You don't use a computer, this is why I bring a printed concordance here, if you can see how to use this, and it's very easy to use it the same way. But if you had software, you can search more than just a single word. You can search for two or three words, or a phrase. We often, when we teach right division, we look at Romans 16.25 and compare it to Acts 3.21, because they both have the same phrase, kept secret, or seek, uh, saying it wrong, since the world began, they have the same phrase. One verse says, kept secret since the world began, and the other one says, as the prophet spoke since the world began. But that phrase is the same in both verses. And so you can use an electronic concordance to find the phrase in every verse in the Bible. It gives you three or four of them. It's interesting to compare those. Okay, How come people didn't know how to rightly divide before? Well, maybe they couldn't do a concordance search on four words at the same time. I don't know. But I can see very clearly, you compare Romans 16 to Acts 3.21, it's the same phrase. Only they're opposite, because one's kept secret and one's not. Now we're teaching prophecy and mystery just by using a concordance. Okay? Luke 170 is another reference to that, looking for that phrase since the world began. So you can search multiple phrases, multiple uh, or phrases or multiple words with software. So that's just the tools that you could use in different ways to use your concordance. Now, when you use a concordance, what it does for you is provides you with a bunch of dots, provides you a bunch of data, a lot of verses with the same word in it. That in itself is good, but it doesn't get you across the finish line. Okay, you actually have to read those verses and compare them. All right, what you have to do with your mind, which God has given you with the Spirit of God in you, to study His words, to make the connections with the verses. I gave you some examples here today where we looked at concordance, and I filtered out the ones I didn't want to use, but I saw connections in certain verses. So as you read through the concordance verses, you can make connections in your mind, right, to study them. Paul says that the spiritual, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You're the spiritual man. This is the spiritual book. Study his words. Make the connections. When you make those connections, th these are the breakthroughs in understanding. I, we went through three or four of these things. We talked about tongues and wormwood and the author confusion and, and the cross. And you can see where you can start to understand things when you make proper connections in your Bible between one verse and another. To many people, the Bible is just a collection of verses. They don't relate to each other at all. The truth is, the Bible is a special book, unique among all other books, and that this is the only way you can study uh, a book like this, is using the Bible. No other book in history has a concordance like the Bible does, being able to pull truths from it like a concordance can allow you to do. Okay? It's a very important tool, and you can create connections that will increase your understanding. The Bible is unique because it has many writers. There are over 40 different author, uh, writers of the book, only one author. Right? God wrote the whole thing. Okay? It's unified. You'll find in your Bible, there are themes, threads in, your, in the Bible. So how do I find those threads? Well, you need to collect a lot of dots, a lot of data. Where are the verses that relate to each other? Where are the verses with the same phrase, the same word in it? And then you start connecting them, trying to compare them to see which ones match. Or which ones contradict. There's something else. They contradict. Maybe there's a difference. All right? So you, you make this analysis. But there are threads in your Bible, and you need to find them. One of the threads that go from the beginning to the end of your Bible is the word Adam. We've been studying Genesis on Tuesdays, and if you look up the word Adam in your concordance, it's interesting how many times he shows up. So one of the popular questions of Christianity today is the creation question, or taking the Bible literally, was Adam a real person? Right? It's a question people ask, is he a real person? Well, there's no verse in the Bible that says, in case your culture asks, Adam was real. You know, there's no verse reference for that. But how can I know that he was real? Well, I'm going to look up my concordance, the name Adam. It gives me every verse that mentions Adam. And it's interesting how many times Adam's mentioned. Jesus mentions the first man and woman. Paul mentions Adam. Adam's mentioned in the Old Testament, okay, by other writers, not just Genesis. So Adam's come up over and over again in the Bible. And not only that, as I read the verses where Adam is mentioned, he's mentioned 32 times, I read in Romans 5, verse 12, that by one man sin entered. And as Adam sinned, we sinned. And, and as the first Adam brought death in the world, the last Adam brings life and quickening spirit. There's a connection in those verses between Adam and Jesus Christ. Salvation requires Adam. Right? And all I did is look at the concordance to find where Adam's mentioned. Because, you know, if all I find Adam's in Genesis chapter 3, 2 and 3, maybe he's not that important. 
but I find him when Jesus talks. I find him when Paul talks about my salvation. That's significant. Okay? If he's not real, suddenly salvation is not needed. That's important. So now it's a faith issue, right? Either he was real, and salvation is real, or he wasn't real, and salvation's nonsense. Using the accordance and making those connections. Okay? From the beginning of my Bible to the end of my Bible. Look up the word Abel. We studied Abel for the last two weeks in Genesis on Tuesday. And uh, this Abel issue, well, people don't spend a lot of time thinking about Abel. But uh, you heard in our lessons that I showed you Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, where it said that Abel offered a, a more excellent sacrifice, and that Jesus called Abel a prophet in Luke chapter 11. And I didn't have to read the whole Bible to find that. I look at the concordance, and I see every time where Abel's mentioned it, and I see, well, hey, look at that. Hebrews mentions him, and Jesus mentioned him. So I can learn that Abel was a prophet just by looking at the verses listed in my concordance. Okay? The word serpent is an interesting study if you want to do a concordance study on the word serpent. Well, is that snake real in the garden? That's kind of hard to believe, right? Well, I get it. If that's all we had, that'd be kind of hard to believe. But you look at the word serpent, study the, the doctrine of the serpent in the Bible, right? Every verse has the word serpent in it, and you find a connection through these verses. Now, there's some that talk about real snakes and the dirt and things like that. But you read things like Paul says, like in the wilderness, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, they tempted the Lord and fell captive to the serpents. And he's telling them not to sin and not to do wrong because they'll fall into captivity of the devil. Right? Or in Matthew 23, verse 33, where Jesus calls the Pharisees serpents and vipers because they take advantage and tell religious lies to people who are trying to seek the truth. Look at Revelation or Mark chapter 16, verse 17. This is a passage that is taken out or at least mentioned that it is not authentic in other translations of the Bible. They're wrong to do so. Mark 16, verse 17 and 18 are authentic verses in your Bible. They are God's words, spirit-inspired words. And perhaps they would change their opinion if they did a study about the serpent in your Bible. Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> Mark 16, 16 says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils and shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Okay, weird verses. Okay, some people try to practice these literally. And I believe the Bible literally. So are we on the same side? Now, of course, we rightly divide the scripture. And so we understand that no one in Mark 16 understood the preaching of the cross. Right, so that helps guard us from making some errors of application here. But just using the concordance to study the doctrine of the serpents, we see that there was a serpent in the Garden of Eden that deceived Eve. We saw Jesus called the Pharisees and the vipers serpents. We see in Mark 16 they have, the, they have the power to take up serpents. They won't hurt them. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus gives the power of his disciples to tread upon serpents. Look at Revelation chapter 9, verse 19. Revelation 9, 19. Coincidentally, before the kingdom comes and the devil is sent down to the earth and there's all sorts of wrath and, and horrible situations happening, you see these creatures that are released to the earth to hurt men. At least all the men except those who believe in Christ. Those who follow the Messiah. But in Revelation 9.19 it says that uh, there was a third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of the mouths of these creatures. He called them horses and lions in verse 17. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads and with them they do hurt. Apparently there are some creatures in Revelation 9 that look like serpents and that are hurting people and God says these are going to hurt men and kill men but Mark 16 says if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry to Israel they'll have the power to take up serpents they'll be protected from serpents Luke 10 he gave the power to his disciples to tread upon serpents Genesis 3.15 what does the prophet say in Genesis 3.15 to the serpent the seed of the woman will step on your head right? will bruise your head right? apparently there's a doctrine of serpents from the beginning to the end of your Bible where God through Israel is going to help them conquer the serpent, which Revelation defines as the dragon. Again, interesting study. You can do some more look up on, on your own about that, but uh, all that comes from a concordance. I don't have to read some speculative book about theology or some, some uh, uh, book written by someone who, who's got strange theories about the Bible. Instead, I read the Bible, use the concordance, and I can find what the Bible says about these things. Okay? So make these connections. Use concordance. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, when you start making these connections with the, in the Bible, you, there's lots of sources to get these connections from. The concordance is the most valuable one. Just by reading the Bible, you start developing a memory for them. Okay, you start making connections in your mind. Sometimes cross references help. 
uh, those books of cross-references, those cross-references sometimes printed in your Bible, be aware of those because they already have their <coughs> interpretation in them. Okay, concordance doesn't have that bias. The concordance are invaluable tools to help you connect some of the dots in your Bible, help you grow to understand it. All right. That was kind of a technical lesson, but hopefully that, that helped shed some light on some Bible study issues. Any questions or comments about?